Hi, in this video we are diving deeper into Lightning FX, a procedural lightning generator for Blender. In the last video we covered the basics of how to get started. Today we are taking it a step further, I'll show you how to turn any mesh into a lightning emitter and then we'll use that knowledge to add dynamic lightning effects to an animated character. Let's get started. Here I've got a simple blender scene set up. I have a character that I want to emit lightning from along with some background meshes for interaction. Lightning FX gives us two main options for emitters, one for static meshes and another specifically for animated ones. For now let's start with the standard lightning emitter. I'll just drag and drop it into the scene, then reset its position like this. You can also use Alt G and Alt R to reset the location and rotation. Next I'll open up the first modifier. Let me quickly collapse the other panels to keep things clean. Now let's make the lightning interact with the surrounding environment. I have already grouped the background meshes into a collection called environment. So back in the modifier settings I'll set our character as the emitter object and select the environment collection as the proximity target. And just like that you'll see lightning bolts start shooting out from the character and striking nearby objects. Switching to wireframe mode makes it easier to see the effect. And when I hit play you'll notice the lightning continues to interact with the environment. To keep things clear for now I'll disable the sparks and smoke modifiers. We'll come back to those later. Now let's fine tune the lightning behavior. The density value controls how many balls are emitted. Increasing it gives you a denser more chaotic effect while lowering it makes things more subtle. The spawn rate determines how frequently lightning is generated and the lifetime min and max values controls how long each bolt stays active. I'll tweak these settings a bit to find a look that fits this scene. Feel free to experiment here. The small changes can make a big difference in the final effect. Let's move on to proximity settings. In this panel, the distance value controls how far the lightning can search for nearby targets to hit. For example, with the distance set to 2 meters, lightning won't reach those meshes at the far end. But if I increase it to 3 meters, you'll see lightning start to connect with them. Next is the heat type which is currently set to raycast normals. This means lightning will only target objects that are in the direction of the emitter's surface normals. To show you what that means, I'll go into edit mode with the character mesh selected. Enable normals. These blue lines represent the direction each face is pointing. So when lightning is emitted, it tries to find targets in that same direction. For example, if lightning is coming from this area, it will only look for targets in this forward facing direction. Now let's switch the heat type to random proximity. You'll notice it immediately generates more lightning strikes. This mode doesn't care about the normals, instead it randomly picks a point within that proximity radius and fires the lightning there. That naturally results in more lightning hits so you might want to lower the density setting when using this mode. For this demo, I'll switch it back to Raycast Normals. Now let's take a look at the distortion settings. These are pretty self-explanatory so they let you control how much the lightning twists and bends. You can play with scale and strength to get the look you want. But an important option here is computation type. It's currently set to sim computed, which means the lightning's distortion and targeting are calculated inside the simulation. That also means if you tweak any values, you will need to refresh or replay the animation to see the changes. Here you can adjust that noise strength. If you switch to independent computation, the targeting still happens in the simulation, but the distortion is applied afterward. This allows for real-time updates in the viewport. Here in the independent section, you can adjust the distortion start and end strength.
and here you have the option to control how distortion fades along the lightning's curve. Inverted U and inverted V apply distortion more to the middle of the lightning while keeping the start and end points more stable. S-curve adds more distortion along the length but it can break the connection to the target making the lightning look more chaotic. And constant applies distortion evenly across the entire curve so it's completely free form and no longer anchored to the emitter or the target. Now I want to bring your attention back to density setting. If you look closely, there's a small icon next to density value that you won't see on other parameters. This lets you toggle between using a constant value and using an attribute input. Clicking this icon switches it to attribute mode. And by default it says density. You can rename it to anything you want. At the moment you will notice lightning is emitting from all over the character including the head which isn't what I want. I want to exclude the head from emitting lightnings. To control exactly where the lightning emits from we can use a vertex group. This allows us to mask out specific areas of the mesh. So I'll select the character, enable overlays and go to the vertex group panel. Create a new vertex group, I'll call it density to match the attribute name we are using in the modifier. Next switch to weight paint mode. From the side view, I'll use the gradient tool and paint it up from here. Red areas will have a full weight of 1. But I also want to exclude this cape and a few other parts. To do that, I'll jump into edit mode, use link select to grab those parts and hit the remove button in the vertex group panel. This removes them from the vertex group and effectively marks them out. Now just copy the vertex group name, go back to the lightning fx modifier and paste it into the attribute input field. Hit play. And you'll see that lightning is no longer spawning from the head or the other excluded areas. Much better. But what if we want to emit more or less lightning now? Since we are using an attribute instead of a fixed density value, we can't just adjust a slider anymore. That's where the attribute enhancer comes in. Go to the lightning FX assets library under geonodes, find the attribute enhancer and drag and drop it onto the emitter mesh. This modifier lets you multiply any attribute. In this case, our density vertex group. Toggle it on and select the vertex group we created earlier. Since we are using this attribute on another mesh, we need to output it properly. So expand the output attribute panel and reselect the same attribute here. This is a critical step. If you skip it, the multiplier won't work. Now. You can adjust the multiplier value to scale the effect. I'll set it to 10 and as you can see that increases the lightning emission a bit. Feel free to play around with that multiplier until you get the intensity that fits your scene. Now I'll enable the sparks and smoke modifiers again. Since the smoke effect uses sprites, we need an active camera in the scene. So I'll add one and frame it like this. Switching over to render view, let's tweak some of the lightning's visual settings. First, I'll reduce the thickness to around 0.1 and then add a bit of constant thickness. Next, I'll adjust the glow color slightly and boost the glow strength. Let's set it to around 500. For the sparks, set the strength to 100. Add some randomness. Enable this gradient option as well with hue at 0.5. I don't want the sparks at the start so I disable that. Then I'll increase the sparks lifetime, assign the environment collection for collisions and reduce the spark size slightly. To add that glow to the lightning, let's set up some compositing. I'll open up a new window and switch it to compositor. Enable use nodes. Change this to camera. Now add a glare node, 
set it to blue. Select high quality and reduce both the size and strength for a softer look. I'll duplicate the glare node to stack a second bloom pass. This time with a larger size and a bit of fine tuning on the strength. Also, I'll increase the threshold so it only affects the brightest areas. And that's how you set up the lightning emitter effect using lightning effects. Now, let's move on to how we can apply all of this to an animated character. Here, I have a new blender project with a similar setup. But this time, our character mesh has a bit of animation. I've already created the density vertex group and set up the compositing nodes, just like before. To add the lightning effects to the animated mesh, I'll drag and drop this lightning emitter animated template. You will recognize it by this little running person icon. Reset the location. Most of the settings here are the same as with the static emitter. I'll assign the character mesh as the emitter and select the environment collection for proximity hits. For the density input, I'll switch it to attribute mode and choose the vertice group we created earlier. And as you can see, the effect is already working nicely with the animation. To keep things simple for now, I'll disable the sparks and smoke modifiers again. The effect looks fine at first, but to make it work properly with animated meshes, we need to generate a proxy mesh for the emitter. This step ensures the lightning can adapt accurately to the character's movement throughout the animation. To do that, I create some space here and open a new window. Let's switch it to the Geometry Nodes editor. Make sure you have the lightning modifier selected on the emitter mesh. And here you will see the full node setup that powers this effect. Don't worry, you don't need to touch most of this. Just zoom into the highlighted node labeled Bake. By default, this is set to still, which is exactly what we want. Now pick a frame from the animation. I usually recommend using the first frame of your character's motion. And click the bake button. That's it. This creates a proxy mesh inside the jump to node system, which helps the effect stay consistent with the character's animated movement. Once that's done, everything else works just like I showed you earlier with the static mesh. Let's also tweak the density for this animated character. I'll grab the attribute enhancer from the lightning FX assets library and drag it onto the character mesh. Toggle it to switch to attribute mode and select our density vertex group from the list. And just like before, make sure to also select it under the output attributes section. Don't skip this step or it won't work. I'll set up the multiplier to 5 for now. Actually, Let's take it a step further and animate this multiplier over time so the lightning emission gradually increases throughout the shot. At the beginning of the animation, I'll set the multiplier to 3 and insert a keyframe. Then I'll move forward a few frames, set it to 10 and towards the end, I'll raise it to 30 and keyframe that as well. This way, the character emits more and more lightning as the animation progresses. After that, I'll fine tune the rest of the settings, just like I did with the previous setup. This time, I am going with a red colored lightning. Once you are happy with the settings, select the lightning emitter, go to the physics tab, and under the simulation nodes, click bake. This will bake the simulation for the selected frame range. By default, the baked files are packed into the Blender's project, but if you want to save them externally, each modifier has an option to change the cache path, so you can direct it to a specific folder if needed. Now, if you want to make further adjustment to the lightning effects later, you'll need to delete the bake first. Keep in mind, doing this will also delete the proxy mesh we created earlier. So, before you tweak any settings, make sure to rebake the proxy mesh first, just like we did before, and then go ahead and update the lightning settings. Once everything looks good, just rebake the simulation. And that's how you create animated lightning emitters 
using lightning effects. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.